welcome back and welcome to our panel five, Curating Nations and States. And the first speaker will be Samuel Albert, who is a Yale-trained art historian whose general focus is on Central Europe. At present, he is involved in a project on Austrian, Austria, <laughs> Austria-Hungarian, Austrian and Hungarian art exhibits from the turn of the century until World War II. This work has been supported by the Frick Collection Center for the History of Collecting, the Potsdiber Institute for Austrian-American Studies, and beginning in fall 2022, a Fulbright grant to Hungary. Thank you, Sam, and... First, uh, thank you all for coming back after the break. Um, and I too would like to thank the members of the Kreis team, Marta, Matthew, Christian, Julia, and Nora. Uh, as you can see, the topic of my talk has changed slightly. I've excluded the Hungarian exhibitions. However, I'm happy to answer any questions about them that people might have in the end. <sighs> so, Imre Kirofi is perhaps the most significant his person in the history of fairs and exhibitions that you've never heard of, at least until yesterday, uh, seen here in later life. Not that he is ignored in academic or popular literature. There are numerous articles and several books that focus on him, but because it is in the history of theater, not exhibitions that he is known. But that is exactly why Keralfi is so significant. A theatrical impresario with decades of experience in front of the curtain and behind it, in his later years, Keralfi turned his skills honed in the theater to exhibitions and fairs. In the 19th century, the 1851 Great Exhibition was the prototype for fairs and exhibitions which followed, both great and small, both in the center and on the margins, even if only serving as a bad example. In three basic elements, the 1851 fair was a trendsetter, site, structure, and subject. In the case of this particular fair, site and structure were closely bound. The fair, and I'm sure most of this is familiar to everyone, uh, took place in Hyde Park where the competition brief called for a design that could be easily assembled and disassembled, and more importantly, would minimally impact the grounds and especially the park plantings. The solution was Joseph Pacton's famous Crystal Palace, a cast iron and glass structure derivative of his work as a greenhouse designer. We see here the original sketch. The structure required no foundation, so the ground remained undisturbed and the assembly and disassembly were quite simple. The ultimate form of the structure seen here on the left, oh, seen here on the left was changed from Paxton's original rather boxy design to a more visually elegant solution with a barrel vaulted transept a response to the presence of a tree which could not be moved, seen on the right. At the fair's end, the structure was disassembled and the park returned to its previous pastoral integrity while the palace was re-erected elsewhere in London where it remained in use until destroyed by fire in the 1930s. This model, erecting a temporary building or buildings, usually in a central location, and then removing them at the conclusion of the fair was one model that would continue but with some modifications. A noteworthy, of that model, a noteworthy example of that model is here in Paris for the 1867, the 1878, the 1889, the 1900, and the 1925 fairs were all situated on the Champ de Mar, and their structures were mostly removed at the conclusion of the fair. The more common model that emerged though was holding the fair in an area that was either under or poorly developed and transforming it, using the fair and its resources as a development tool create a park or sometimes a permanent exhibition ground. Chicago's 1893 World's Columbian Exhibition or St. Louis's 1904 Louisiana Purchase Exhibition are examples of this type of development. In Chicago, the fair's development created Jackson Park where there still stands one of the few permanent structures of the fair, Charles Underwood's Palace of Fine Arts, now the Field Museum of Science. In the case of St. Louis, Several hundred acre marshy area west of the town was drained, landscaped, and developed into Forest Park. Here too, a permanent structure remains, Cass Gilbert's St. Louis Art Museum, which for the duration of the fair was supplemented by two temporary wings, all hosting the general fine arts displays. The subject of the fairs of late 19th and early 20th century were also influenced by the Great Exhibition. Its precise title, Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations, shows the reach, if not the actual grasp of the organizers. 
Building on that model, fairs have tended to have a historical raison d'etre, celebrating momentous national or international events from Franz Josef's 25 years on the throne, Vienna 1873, to the centennial of the French Revolution, Paris 1889, to the 400th or so anniversary of Columbus's discovery of the New World, Chicago 1893, or the centennial of the Louisiana Purchase, St. Louis 1904. One final aspect of the fairs, again, following the example of the 1851 fair, was the generally dismal economic result. The fairs were often loudly, patriotically, and falsely heralded as money-making opportunities. Infrequently was that the case. Though the fairs as a whole were often deeply mired in red ink, some areas, some portions, particularly amusement areas, were quite profitable, clashing with the more noble aspirations of the fairs organizers. In the, oh, what happened? Sorry. Uh, in the case of the 1893 Chicago Fair, the associated Midway Plaisance was highly profitable, much more so than the fair as a whole, despite the extraordinarily large number of visitors. The, the Midway Plaisance featured a variety of gym crack exhibitions, restaurants, and beer halls. Gentle touch. Uh, one of the most popular and profitable attractions was Cairo Street, a very similar recreation of a street in Cairo, populated by Kyrenes, transported to the United States for that purpose. The transgressive nature of the uncivilized drew, gods of hor drew hordes of gawkers. Particularly popular was a sideshow featuring the dancer Little Egypt performing a belly dance nicknamed the Hoochie Coochie. Burlesque clothed, as it were, in the study of the exotic. These types of very similar displays were common. Uh, many fairs featured national ethnographic villages as well as displays of, quote, savages, unquote, now commonly referred to as human zoos. These recreations were not limited to the exotic. The 1892 the theater exhibition in Vienna, for instance, featured a recreation of Vienna's Hohe Mark, from 200 years ago, which was then reconstructed in Chicago the next year on the Midway Plaisance as Old Vienna. These recreations provided not only the chance to travel through time, but through space as well. In an era of limited and expensive travel, recreations of dream, dream destinations were quite common. Venice, for instance, could be found in Vienna at Venedig and Wien in Washington State at the Lewis and Clark Exhibition, or in London at the Olympia. The latter two were run by the Kiralfi brothers, Boloshi, who organized Venice in Washington, and Imre, who worked in London. Imre, 1845-1919, and his brother Balash, anglicized to Boloshi, 1848-1832, began their careers at a very young age as dancers. Initially self-trained, the two began to receive formal lessons once their father recognized their talents. They took the stage name Kiralfi, abandoning their original last name of Königsbaum, supposedly to avoid police trouble stemming from their father's participation in the revolution of 1848. But there were two other clear advantages to the name change. In Hungary and German-speaking countries, the new name, Kiralfi, obscured their obvious Jewish origins. Outside of Hungary, the stage name added a frisson of Magyar exoticism. This exoticism colored their early dance routines as well. Many were based on traditional Hungarian folk dances, shot through with jeté and other Terpsichorean flourishes performed by Imre. The exoticism was further emphasized by his garb, derived from Hungarian hussar uniforms, knee-high boots with tight pants whose seams were covered with frogging, and a menta, a traditional jacket hung over his shoulders. The boys found great success in Hungary and abroad. Eventually, six of their seven siblings joined them, creating the Kiralfi dance family. In the early 1870s, after close to two decades of performing, Imre and Baloshi moved from performance to production. Drawing on their long personal experiences, they began devoting themselves to spectacle, a new type of performance emerging at this time. More expansive than legitimate theater, it emphasized scale, stagecraft, and technical bravada over drama. Such shows, and especially those produced by the Kiralfi brothers, often featured casts of thousands and were generally centered on broad historical spectacles with flashes of the scandalous, 
giving what was essentially popular entertainment at least the sheen of culture and sophistication. One theater they built and operated was the Caralfi Alhambra in Philadelphia, later the Broad Street Theater. Its Orientalism is an example of the exoticism which the Kiralfis exploited through their careers. Coevel with the 1876 Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition, they produced an adaptation of Jules Verne around the world in 80 days, benefiting from the increased audiences drawn to the fair. This production model, creating a spectacle, later ones were more often directly related to the theme of a fair, in the city of the fair, but not at the fair site, was one which Imre would draw upon until the first decades of the 20th century. As they gained, gained ever greater commercial success, discord grew between the brothers. Finally, in 1887, disagreement over a business deal brought their professional relationship to the breaking point and the two parted ways. Both remained in the United States, each producing his own shows. Imre spe emphasizing spectacle, Boloshi emphasizing choreography. Shortly after the dissolution of the partnership in 1888, Imre produced Nero, or the Fall of Rome, staged in a theater constructed for the show on Staten Island. The building and show were financed by Erastus Women, a ferry owner and Staten Island-based developer. With a cast of over 2,000, the spectacle, highly profitable to both Kiralfi and women, reaffirmed that, Kira, that Imre would continue to successfully produce spectacles even without his brother's contribution. After having teamed up with Barnum and Bailey Circus, he produced a traveling production of the same show. Again, in 1892, Imre teamed up with Barnum and Bailey Circus to produce Columbus and the Discovery of America. Timed to coincide with the 400th anniversary of the discovery of America, it had many features typical of Kiralfi's spectacles, such as the song and dance celebration of Columbus's return to Barcelona. The next year, coinciding with the World's Columbian Exhibition, Kiralfi produced I mean, the modestly named Imre Kiralfi's grand historical spectacle, America in Four Acts and 17 Scenes. <laughs> Like the Philadelphia show of some 17 years earlier, it was designed to draw attendees to the fair, though in this case, the theme was more closely aligned with that of the fair. It was still, though, a Kiralfian production. We see here an image of the concluding number of scene two, the grand ballet of arts and sciences. Flush with cash from the success of America, Kiralfi bought a controlling interest in Earl's Court, an exhibition, an exhibition space in London founded and developed by John Robinson Whiteley. Despite producing several large and somewhat successful shows, Whiteley was not happy with the profits or the enterprise and sold the exhibition and entertainment area, going on to become more successful as a land developer in France. The exhibition grounds located within and around a triangle created by the Midland Railway, the West London Extension Railway and the District District Railway enjoyed easy access to London and the larger cities of Great Britain. Whitley's inaugural show, the American Exhibition, celebrated, though a few years late, the centennial of John Adams' presentation of his diplomatic credentials to the Court of St. James. Nominally organized to portray the economic and cultural development of the United States, the major and most memorable attraction, as well as the largest draw of the exhibition, was the Buffalo Bill Wild West show, which included both equestrian performances and more static displays of American Indian life. The guests of the show numbered numerous royal figures, including Queen Victoria, a fact Buffalo Bill was quick to advertise. Whitley produced a new national show annually, the American Exhibition of 1887, was followed by the Italian Exhibition in London of 1888, the Spanish Exhibition of 1889, the French, French Exhibition in 1890, and his last national show, the German Exhibition of 1891. The final show produced, also in 1891, was Captain Boynton's Water Show, which featured performing sea lions and introduced the water chute to Europe. By now, any pretense of cultural enlightenment had disappeared. This postcard 
with a creative representation of the fairgrounds as evidence of that. When Caralfi bought the grounds in 1893, he brought all his theatrical experience and talent to bear and transformed the exhibition grounds into a thriving internationally renowned enterprise. Uh, for his first production, the Empire of India exhibition, much of the space was altered, particularly the central exhibition area. The large barn-like structure on the left, constructed for the Buffalo Bill Wild West show, was torn down and replaced with the Empress Theater, a single-level auditorium with a capacity of about 5,000. The large area opened up by the demolition was reconstructed as well. The area renamed by Kiralfi the Western Garden, and that is this part uh, in the center with the oval there, uh, remained relatively untouched. The area was populated by a variety of refreshment stands. Uh, it was also the site of the Welcome Club, originally constructed as a private club on the grounds for the use of the Welcome Committee of the American Exhibition, a group of about a thousand socially significant Englishmen and participants at the American Exhibition. Many of them were simply awarded membership as a way to create buzz about the exhibition or to use a more modern terminology, get influencers to post about it. Kiralfi, recognizing the utility of this idea, retained but rebuilt the club, creating the old welcome club. He too gifted memberships to socially prominent, but also to exhibitors and organizers of the show. To suit the needs of Kiralfi's first show, the 1895 Empire of India exhibition, the overall area was reconstructed. The Imperial Court Garden, Mughal style central pavilion, Mughal influenced colonnade, as well as the adjoining, quote, Indian city, unquote, whose structures included a model, jung a model jungle, a, a Burmese poi, a native bazaar, an Indian tea house, and a, quote, Hindu mosque, unquote, which was used by, quote, the Mohammedans who are sojourning at Earl's Court during the exhibition, unquote, were constructed to create a very similar atmosphere for the fair's visitors. I would also point out, as is common in Kierdolfi's works, his name features prominently everywhere. Also constructed at the fair, and eventually becoming an icon of Earl's Court as a whole, was the giant wheel, a Ferris wheel with 40 carriages, each with a capacity of 30 people. And we see here on the left, the wheel, and on the right, a certificate from the Empire of India exhibition certifying travel upon the wheel. While the shows organized by Kiralfi over the next decade following the India, Empire of India exhibition focused on different regions and topics, an international universal exhibition, which was not truly international or universal, the Greater Britain exhibition, Paris and London, International Fire Exhibition, an Italian exhibition, the Imperial Royal Austrian exhibition in 1906, and finally the Balkan States exhibition of 1907, the basic grounds and structures remained the same. Uh, you see here the four plans that show how even as the themes stayed the same, very little was changed. The buildings were simply refaced or new backdrops were put up. Spaces were renamed, but they kept their same form. As seen here in the Hungarian exhibition with its Mughal style pavilion and colonnade still present. Kiralfi's work at Earl's Court was a novel amalgam of the traditional public garden, the amusement park, the beer hall, and the modern exhibition. Unlike traditional fairs and exhibitions, profit, not education or national glorification, was the motive. Kiralfi pursued it with a singularly sharp focus. Many of the financial and logistical problems which traditional fairs had faced were overcome by Kiralfi and his endeavor. The siting was convenient to major transportation lines, and the structures were solid and permanent. It was only the backdrops that changed. The ice caves of one exhibition became the coal mine of another. Kiralfi set out to make Earl's Court a desirable destination for all classes, with elements such as the old welcome club, to appeal to the upper class with its limited and select membership, but also numerous refreshment kiosks, concerts, dances, and other forms of popular entertainment were present to attract the masses. Even as he was developing and profiting from this new exhibition form, Kiralfi remained involved with more traditional international fairs and their organizations. In addition to regularly visiting fairs all over the world, for almost every world's fair in which Great Britain participated, he was retained as an advisor. 
at the 1904 St. Louis Purchase Exhibition, for, for instance. He was an advisor to the British Exhibition Committee, while at the same time, he produced a spectacle which took advantage of the fair, in this case, the subtly named Kiralfi's Louisiana Purchase Spectacle. His participation in international fair culture was also formal. He was the British Commissioner General for the 1905 Liège World's Fair. Following the 1907 Baltic States Exhibition, Kiralfi's attention shifted from Earl's court, though he still retained title in the production company, to the development and construction of his last endeavor, Shepherd's Bush, the exhibition grounds known as the White City. And here we see on the right his proposed design, and on the left a plan of the realized design. The image of Chicago's 1893 White City remained with Kiralfi and informed at least the outward appearance of his new undertaking. Completed for the 1908 uh, Franco-British exhibition, the White City was the sum of all his experience. First, it was a dedicated exhibition space designed to host changing exhibitions, most of which were bilateral. The structures were solid and permanent and of a uniform neoclassical-ish design. The topics might change, but the buildings housing them did not. Additionally, the entertainment features were built in as part of the design, not added on later, the famous flip-flop. The water and canal system were an integral and integrated part of the design. The hodgepodge design that had characterized earlier fairs and exhibitions and Earl's Court was banished. Second, it was deliberately conveniently located, not just placed on available land, but deliberately sited to be accessible by underground. Third, it was designed for profit, not for enlightenment. And the costs of exhibition were borne mostly by the countries exhibiting, not the Kiralfi organization, which did nonetheless remain right, retain rights to the concessions. Also, there was a tiered admission system. There was a general admission fee to the grounds with a discounted seasonal pass available, but some features had additional admission fees. Kiralfi also created at Shepherd's Bush a garden club which was the updated version of the old Welcome Club. Membership was three guineas a year for men, two guineas a year for women, and included free admission to the exhibits. Space was still reserved for the more popular and changing exhibits, the ethnographic village. There were also some temporary structures built. As exhibits changed, the features would change, but the location would not. We see, oh, oh there we go. Um, we see here at the Franco-British -Ex exhibition, uh, the two villages, Bally McClinton and the Senegalese village. The White City was host to a number of exhibitions. Following the Franco-British exhibition, there was the Imperial International Exhibition in 1909, the Japan-British Exhibition in 1910, the Latin-British Exhibition in 1912, and the final exhibition, the Anglo-American Exhibition of 1914, which was cut short by the outbreak of the First World War. The cultural and economic changes which followed the war meant the end for Kiralfi's White City, but its history stands as a testament to the vision of Imre Kiralfi, who saw the international not just as an arena for international cultural exchange, but a way to both educate and entertain, and turn a profit doing so. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam, for this really interesting paper and for introducing us to the colorful person of Imre Kiralfi. And now I would like to ask our next speaker, Mira Kozanova, to join us here. So Mira Kozanova is currently completing her PhD project on artists from the Russian Empire living in Paris between 1900 and 1917, with a special focus on their ethnic, cultural, religious, and national diversity. She is uh, writing this PhD at the University of Bamberg, where she currently holds a scholarship. And today she will be speaking about the Soviet contribution to the Exposition Interna Internationale of Paris in 1925. Thank you for the introduction and for the invitation. It is, uh, I must say, a real privilege to be speaking here today. Um, at the Exposition Internationale des Arts Décoratifs et uh, Industrielles Modernes in Paris in 1925, 
The newly recognized Soviet Union was given a platform to present its uh, renewed art and culture. The Soviet contribution to this exposition was situated on three uh, main locations. First was uh, the um, renowned Soviet pavilion. I don't know why it's changing slides. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, designed by Konstantin Melnikov that uh, accommodated three different uh, sections. Second, uh, were the no less famous contributions to the furniture ensemble uh, at the Galerie de l'Esplanade des Invalides, namely Alexander Rochenko's uh, Workers' Club and uh, Izba Chitalne, Izba Reading Room, designed by Anton Lavinsky, a student of Futemas, two displays that proposed recreation spaces for self-education and cultural leisure activities. And lastly, uh, a significant collection of exhibits was displayed in six rooms of uh, the uh, Grand Palais, covering a total area of about 500 square meters. This display included various sections of which we will later look more closely at the section of Kustari and the section of arts uh, and industry of uh, ceramics. Um, Kustar is uh, the Russian term for peasant artisans that received a specific connotation since um, uh, the revival of the folk art uh, in the 19th century, and Elizabeth will be later talking more uh, in more detail about that. In my paper today, I will uh, first briefly outline the general impetus of the Soviet organizers and a possible curatorial strategy for its realization and then focus on the particular parts of the Soviet contribution uh, crucial for this strategy. Uh, the overall declared, uh, declared aim um, of the Soviet organizers as Paris Ternavet, the director of the Museum of Modern Art in Moscow and a member of the exhibition committee, put it in the introduction to the exhibition catalog was, um, quote, to show the true face of a country whose life is organized on new grounds according to principles of labor, simplicity, and perfect adaptation to its task, um, unquote. The works for these exhibitions were carefully selected according to their ability to showcase progress and renewal of cultural life on all levels of the new society. Despite the revolution, civil war and famine, most importantly, they had to be considered promising for successful reception by Western public. In order to estimate such a success, the organizers um, had to rely on previously gained international experiences, such as uh, the Exposition Universelle in Paris in 1900, or the um, uh, exposition of Russian art organized by Sergei Diaghilev at the Salon de Temps in 1906. A particular formula of success seems to be common to these exhibitions from Russia abroad. A formula that combines references to the cultural heritage or some sort of artistic tradition, and um, at the same time displays the creative originality of the contemporary artworks, which could fit in the, into uh, the current European art scene. The Soviet contribution to the Exposition des Arts Decoratifs seems to show a similar approach of combining traditional and modernist tendencies. On the uh, one hand, we see an important role assigned to constructivism, which symbolized artistic, cultural and technical progress. And on the other hand, was artisan art that served as uh, an elaborate device, not only to symbolize the revival of popular labor according to the new ideology, but also to construct a certain continuity between Russian in the supranational sense and Soviet identities. A continuity which was based on the notion of peasant populations as the keeper of national identity. Moreover, both the constructivist artworks and the works of Kostari were considered as a fairly safe choice in terms of a positive reception. David Sternberg, uh, uh, the artistic director of, uh, director of the presented Soviet section, had already gained valuable experience by organizing the first Russian exhibition in the Van Diemen Gallery in Berlin in 1922. This exhibition made it clear that among the uh, various movements of Russia's heterogeneous avant-garde art, the European art critics considered constructivism as the most contemporary and promising. Likewise, the art of Kostari had already gained success with the pavilion called the Russian Village at the 1900 Exposition Universelle in Paris, this arts and crafts pavilion presented works of artisans and contemporary artists working in neo-Russian style, 
originating mostly from the artistic colonies in Abramsovo and Telashkina, two places that were emblematic for the development of this new national style. Based on this outline of the exhibition strategy, I would like to argue that it is crucial to not reduce the reception of the Soviet contribution to its modernist aspects, but instead to consider all three components, uh, contemporary art, art of Costa Rica, and uh, folk art of further Soviet, um, rural regions um, of the Soviet Union, as equally important for understanding the official Soviet uh, construct of their renewal, um, of the national renewal. In the following, I would like to take a closer look at the last two lesser known components of this contribution, paying particular attention to the key individuals who were involved in the organization of these sections, um, as their involvement revealed certain inconsistencies in these official constructs. The Kostar section was organized by Alexei Walter and Nikolai Bertram and consisted of six tents showcasing collections of the Moscow Kostari Museum. Um, of which Bertrand was the former and Walter the current director. The installation was realized mainly by the artist Durnovo, who was already involved in the preparation of the 1900s Exposition Universelle, where he assisted Konstantin Karovin uh, on the construction of the Russian village. Between 1910 and 19, uh, 1902 and 1910, he was the director of St. Petersburg um, Kustar Museum, um, a post that involves the organization of all major exhibitions um, uh, of Kustar goods abroad, such as the 1906 Milan International Exhibition and the 1913 Ideal Home Exhibition in London. In this context, the um, Exposition des Arts Decoratifs can be seen as a continuation of this imperial tradition of ex to exhibit Kustar art in the West, and Dornova was perfectly skilled to estimate and satisfy the taste and demand of the West European public. The selected exhibits um, were supposed to shed light on the current Kostar industry, which counted after the new Soviet statistics, 400,000 artisans. Its uh, display included toys, carved wood, pottery, embroidery, lace, objects on papier mache, many more goods from a large number of schools, among others in Palekhova, Sergiev Passat, Bogorodsky and Terzok. A large part uh, of the presented Kostar art, art revealed a uh, modernization that was immediately noticeable at the site of the new motifs. The Soviet catalog for the exhibition reads, quote, in recent years we find many examples of the use of uh, Soviet motifs, uh, the interpretation of the life of the Red Army and um, a new social symbolism, unquote. With this formulation of finding something, the authors play with the misconception widespread among the Western public that the Kostar production was uh, autonomous and in this sense authentic and just needed to be found. In reality, the Kostar art underwent significant modernization, especially since its 1905 uh, reform movement, which ultimately led to a commercialization of the Kostar industry and a specific division of labor into supervisors and workers. In this scenario um, of labor division, the creative spark came from an artistic expert from above, whose designs were then carried out by the Kostari uh, with various ways of deviation and interpretation. In fact, artists as Ternovo made their very career as part of this Kostar reform movement. Ternovo's uh, work for one of uh, Russia's oldest woodworking centers, uh, Semyonovsky Oyest in Nizhny Novgorod province since uh, 1910, where he provided artisans with his improved designs, can be considered exemplary for this practice. Although there was a discontinuity between the pre- and post-revolutionary Kostar activities and major reorganizations of the Kostar workshops and institutions after the Civil War, the general structure of the Kostar industry, however, did not change. This is precisely why involvement of such figures as uh, Durnova, Walter and Bertram in the preparation of the Kostar section in, um, in the 1925 exhibition was quite problematic. All of them were closely interlinked with this um, paradox of folk art revival from above and were now trying in the same manner to adapt the material culture of peasants to the needs of industrialized Soviet Russia. This approach from above um, is difficult to reconcile with uh, the Soviet ideology aimed at enabling the peasant population and the urban proletariat to gain agency over themselves. Moreover, the Soviet officials had no reservations to assign the preparation of the section 
built in Moscow Custom Museum, represented by Walter and Bertram, and institu uh, an institution that was at the very core of this reform movement. It played a decisive role in firmly intertwining the connection between artistic improvements and increased profits, with the result that the Kostar art industries um, had almost completely metamorphosed into a highly regulated form of industrial art long before the revolution. It becomes evident that although the Soviet officials tried to paint a clean break with the bourgeois past and the art of Kostari was heavily influenced by wealthy individuals in the private sector, in 1925, they were still heavily dependent on the very individuals who had been strongly associated with these um, pre-revolutionary developments. At the same time, it must be noted that in some aspects, this structure of Kostar production also played into hands uh, to the Soviet ideology in regard to the suppression of individual initiative in favor of collectivization and centralization of regional affairs in Moscow. Um, Soviet porcelain can be seen as one further step in this direction toward mass production and machine labor. The porcelain room was situated together with the art of Kostari in the uh, Grand Palais. Four factories were presented here, of which the state porcelain manufacturer in uh, Leningrad, former imperial uh, porcelain factory, was the most uh, notable one. The exhibited porcelain uh, was closely related to the propaganda needs of uh, the young Soviet government, and included agitation pieces and uh, figurines representing leading Soviet figures, but also pieces uh, with uh, traditional themes depicting old Russia, peasant life and fairy tales, um, as well as porcelain with cubist, suprematist and constructivist designs. This approach of applying new motives to uh, rather traditional forms is similar to what we have already seen happening in the textile industry. The organizers emphasized particularly the creative power of the abstract non-objective designs by Malevich and Chikatitin, um, <clears throat> writing in the exhibition catalog rather proudly that, uh, that they, quote, produce originality and um, um, uh, produce uh, the, uh, the impression of freshness, originality, and of uh, innovative austerity, unquote. At the same time, they reduced this uh, originality merely to its decorative value, stating a little further that, quote, curves which seem absurd in painting become interesting when applied to porcelain, unquote. A systematic analysis of the porcelain display remains outside of my paper today. Instead, in the last presentation, uh, um, part of my presentation, I would like to shed light on this section of uh, the national ensembles, um, which was organized by the art critic Jakob Tugenholt, and Professor Alexander Miller, who also prepared its display um, in the National Pavilion. This section shows um, objects of uh, 33 na uh, nations from different regions um, in the Soviet Russia, such as its North and Central regions and its autonomous republics, but also uh, further republics of the Soviet Union, namely Ukraine, Belarus, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and the Transcaucasian Union, which included Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. The displayed exhibits in this exhibition did not quite fit the general concept of the Exposition des Adoucoratifs, which required the submitted works of art and industry to demonstrate fresh inspiration and true originality. The reception of the French critics turned out accordingly, as they observed somewhat astonished that, quote, the USSR has stuck to its fundamental and national production and has not been afraid to offer us a retrospective exhibition of, its, uh, of the picturesque costumes used in the various regions of its immense territory." Unquote. Indeed, whereas the majority of Russian costari were now working primarily for others, for the market, for sale, the exhibits, uh, these exhibits were still, for the most part, goods made by peasants for their own use, and therefore genuine folk art, which seemed untouched by the process of industrialization and modernization. It is all the more interesting that it was placed prominently in the Soviet pavilion by Melnikov, which, in my opinion, illustrates its indispensable and instrumental significance for constructing the new Soviet appeal. Firstly, <coughs> it was uh, uh, supposed to exemplify the expansion of artistic, cultural and national renewal to further regions of the Soviet Union, testifying to the success of the social and political transformation, which was, of course, not limited um, to folk art. Secondly, the organizers used uh, this display as a means to disassociate themselves from the national politics of the Russian Empire, 
which presented itself at the 1900 Exposition Universelle as a Western-style empire with a pavilion in the section of the foreign colonies called Siberia and Russian Asia. The Soviet organizers of the 1925 exhibition, in contrast, distanced themselves um, explicitly from this appearance um, as an internal colonizer, as well as from the imperial politics of Russification. Tugenholt, uh, who was the head of the fine arts department um, of Glav Palit Prasvet, main political and educational committee of Narkompros, declared that the October Revolution, quote, proclaimed the brotherhood and equality of nations without dividing them into superior and inferior groups, unquote. He furthermore said it's a new narrative of a common oriental tradition, a certain characteristic traits uh, common to the free and autonomous Soviet nations and their cultures, despite the obvious differences in their artistic expression. However, Tugendhal did not elaborate on what these common traits consisted of. In the absence of, a, uh, of clear starting points, Professor Miller, for his part, res uh, resorted to a rather conventional exhibition display in which uh, showcases were arranged separately according to nations. Each nation was provided with information about its social and cultural life, while the artistic value of the objects themselves was um, hardly mentioned. Miller's ethnographic approach revealed his still prevalent imperial gaze that other the presented nations and differed little from his approach in uh, the Russian um, Museum in St. Petersburg, where Miller created an ethnographic department uh, shortly before the revolution. Thirdly, and lastly, one further goal um, was uh, um, to make Western consumers aware of the uh, existence of these goods in order to find profitable outlets for their export. On the first floor of the Soviet pavilion, just above the section of the national ensembles, was located the room of uh, the commercial sector, Gastor, realized mostly by Alexander Rochenka. Another 12 kiosks um, of Gastor, built after Melnikov's design and painted by artists um, Alexander Exter and Victor Barth, located nearby, um, um, sold apart from folk art and other costar goods, also porcelain and books. The establishment of um, export stores was certainly not a novelty, as uh, Kostar stores had already been opened throughout Europe before World War I. However, the guiding principle now was apparently to expand the variety of exported goods. However, this attempt does not seem to have had any lasting success, as critic uh, Georgi Luk uh, Lukomsky painted, uh, pointed out in 1928. The works of the Kostari constitute, along with the triumph of Palais Rus, the only export articles which have propagated the uh, renown of Russian art abroad. To summarize, as I have argued, the Soviet organizers have constructed an image of a national renewal on the basis of three aspects. First, modern uh, constructivist works, thus constructing an image of artistic, cultural, and technical progress. Um, second, traditional art of Kostari, showing renewal of popular labor while at the same time maintaining a bridge to um, certain artistic tradition of the peasant populations and uh, thus showing a continuity of national identity. And finally, folk art of further Soviet republics, asserting that the cultural renewal spread to all areas of the Soviet Union. Considering this triad together, which in a nutshell represents a renewed culture, its traditional basis and its future tendencies, provides a more comprehensive picture of the Soviet construct um, of uh, national renewal at the Exposition des Arts Decoratifs. A closer look at the backgrounds and motivations of the section organizers adds another layer to this complex narrative, ultimately leading to more nuanced understanding of the Soviet contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mira. This was really fascinating. And now let us welcome our third speaker, Elvira Ibragimova. So Elvira Ibragimova is a historian who specializes in the study of links between architecture and politics. She holds a specialist degree in political science and master's degrees in art history and in comparative history. She is currently a PhD, PhD candidate at the Central European University in Budapest. And her doctoral project is titled Unrealized and Unrealizable, Architectural Projects and Ideas in Interwar Belgrade and Zagreb. And today she will be talking about architects, artists, and the state in search of Yugoslav representation at World's Fairs. So thank you, Elvira, for joining us. And yeah, please. Uh, thank you, Nora, for the introduction, and um, thank for organizers for organizing this 
excellent event. So today I will present you the short history of the Yugoslav pavilions of, for the World Fairs in the interim period, so before the Second, First and Second World Wars. I would like to mention in the beginning that there is already a great research done in the question of national representation and cultural policy of the pavilions uh, from the position of the state, how actually state imagined this uh, Yugoslav unity and how uh, it's tried to uh, demonstrate it on this exhibition for these pavilions. But in my presentation today, I would like to switch focus to the architects themselves and try to trace their agenda and their ideas uh, and their involvement on this uh, process. Uh, first of all, I will uh, tell you some short introduction uh, about uh, the kingdom itself because uh, it was formed after the First World War as uh, the Kingdom of Serb, Croats and Slovenes, later renamed as the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. It's actually, it was a very complex state in all sense, because first of all, it was uh, organized uh, connecting uh, independent Serbia and Montenegro with some former Ottoman territories, with the former parts of Austro-Hungarian Empire. And, uh, state faced a lot of problems with this uh, political life and administrative division with a lot of conflicts between not only different political forces but also between different national groups and actually this unstable political situation led to the situation when the king Alexander I proclaimed royal dictatorship uh, promoting his idea of integral Yugoslavia. Actually uh, in his mind and actually for some period it was official policy of the state, that was the idea that uh, Yugoslavia and Yugoslavian race, it's kind of specific uh, type of race, and these differences between the so-called tribes, Serb, Croat, and Slovens, they not matter, and actually it was an idea to create this stage which will unite all these tribes. Opposing to this idea, it was so-called real or realist Yugoslavism. Uh, in this ideology, uh, politicians actually understand that there is differences between these tribes, they have a uh, different background and different history, but the task is uh, just uh, recognize these existing differences and try to construct unity, understanding which will incorporate the specifics also of this truth. Of course, there is also opposition to the Yugoslavis and Yugoslav idea itself, national uh, ideologies of Serb, Croat, Slovenes, and also some other ethnic minorities there. So the situation in this case, how to present Yugoslav identity was really not easy task, taking into account both these national differences and political circumstances. Also, uh, actually, Architects also was not a homogeneous group. Uh, there were different groups in uh, Yugoslav architecture with different education, different background, different orientation, including stylistic one and other ideas. For example, in the kingdom, there were three main technical faculties, uh, but also not all architects finished them. Some of them had get their education abroad in France and in Germany, and also was a lot of uh, differences and uh, influences uh, which actually affect their position, especially when we discuss getting some Yugoslav task. Of course, there was uh, competition between all these architects. And also, even if we try to imagine how these people try to create this new Yugoslav architecture, because of these complex characters, and different architectural ideas, there were a lot of ways how to do it. For example, one of the strategy quite typical for creating national styles in architecture is just to look in the past, to use some historical tradition. But in case of Yugoslavia, it's immediately a question what kind of tradition and what kind of architecture to use. There is one attempt to try to find some common features in the past, and of course in the for Balkan countries, it could be only the vernacular tradition. And in this case, it was only one common uh, historical architectural background. But there is also was an idea what, okay, we have this different uh, uh, architectural tradition, but we can synthesize them in some new Yugoslav architecture, but it's only part of the strategies because some architects propose rather universalizing so, uh, 
strategies, for example, use um, classical academic architecture because it's actually avoiding all these differences and neglecting like this problem by creating the image of the state being united, being uh, uh, prosper, being strong, and all other connotations with neoclassical architecture here. Or, for example, some architects try to create image of Yugoslavia as a new founded, young and strong uh, state uh, and looking to the future uh, and trying to create like this highly modernized vision of Yugoslavia. Again, quite unifying because there is no these differences between these tribes. But I also would like to mention here what for some architects, it wasn't even a problem or the agenda to think about Yugoslav architecture. They were just doing what they're doing and didn't even understand that maybe there could be some ideological agenda behind it works. And for example, uh, interesting case that in some architectural publication, then they even discuss this problem of uh, style. They're not referred to it as a Yugoslavian one. They just said our style, which can actually put a researcher in a difficult situation because you try to understand by saying our, they mean Yugoslav or Serbian or Croatian, or maybe even some local type of architects because some architects were really very close related to the cities. And maybe they, our architecture is architecture suitable for the city. So for example, not all of them actually deal with this Yugoslav architecture, but when we speak about national pavilion, of course it was a task which they should face. And for example, first time uh, the Kingdom of Serb Croat Sloens uh, participate in this international exhibition with its pavilion in 1925. And uh, this participation was full of problems. Not only this ideological one about how to represent, uh, but also a lot of administrative problem because of this unstable character, political uh, crisis and uh, constant personal changes. And actually because it's early 20s and the state it's only new form, they were not uh, a lot of understanding how actually organize this kind of thing. And one of the main problem was how to select this project. Because in theory, there is three way how to select the project organize a competition and choose project, not an architect and put uh, this uh, project on the first place. Or for example, if they speak about official institution, there is an opportunity to appoint architects who actually were Minister of Construction, or there is another way, very popular to private architecture, but not that popular to public one, just to order uh, for a project from a specific architect based on his taste, reputation, and other factors. Of course, if the speak task to create national pavilion, it was obvious way to organize a competition, but it was not the case uh, here, because firstly, the Ministry of Construction, uh, pretending to monopoly other public architecture, just appoint its architect to create a project. But uh, then organizational com a committee was strongly against it, and they propose an idea, for example, to invite the most famous architects in the Kingdom of Yugoslavia and this period, which is Joži Plečnik, but Plečnik ignored this task. And then they decide, okay, maybe we should choose someone else. And they propose this task to creation architects, Tjeban Hribar, who created a project. But the Minister of Trade and Industry, who should uh, control this organization process, just ignored this decision and presented another project, ordering by another architect, Miroslav Krejcik. And I will tell a bit about him because it's actually a difficult task. It's only one project which we know from him. We know what uh, he was living in Paris in this period, being young, uh, talented, according to newspaper architect. But later he was more famous and active in his activities as a First World War uh, veteran. And it's only one his attempt to create architectural project, but the, this first task was very important to this national pavilion. And actually in this case, we have very clear his agenda because he uh, gave commentary to the newspapers explaining his idea, what he's actually doing here, creating a uh, national pavilion. And he mentioned that he tried to put different regional traditions in a modern way. And he even uh, made a statement what he actually thought what this could be a way for future development of common style. 
But uh, this attempt uh, was unsuccessful and it was heavily criticized both by the French uh, committee who mentioned that they actually organized the exhibition of modern arts and this project could not be considered as modern. And also Yugoslav com committee and Yugoslav art critics who were strongly opposed this kind of synthesizing things which uh, have no, like um, they even blamed creative having bad taste in architecture. And in this case, the committee used this situation actually to promote again this uh, Stepan Hriber uh, project and you can see that uh, here it uh, was more safe strategy just avoid referencing to any kind of tradition so here we can see this combination of universalizing and modernizing strategy but the final result uh, was uh, so no it less that uh, mainly photos which were published on newspapers it's only photo of the wooden portal um, in the entrance of the building the building itself uh, was highly criticized with being neither modern nor national and being uh, faceless but this wooden uh, portal and frescoes uh, got some attention both from the public and from the Yugoslav but some architects try to defend Stephen Fieber project. But I think here uh, there is also a problem because according to archival source, the project themselves was changed a lot of times. So it's actually what we can see here. It's not his initial idea because all other organizer also proposed uh, some changes. And finally, in this case, we cannot say what we can see here, like some specific artistic creativity because under these influences, of uh, lack of time, lack of money, it also was changed. But actually, there were also additional uh, kiosks to this uh, pavilion. And uh, then in this case, the Ministry of Trade and Industry uh, decided to organize a competition. But there's a specific one, because they decided to invite only Belgrade architects in this case, because Zagreb-based architects, design main pavilion and now we need to have a space to the uh, Serbian architects to show they were also. For example, it was also in case uh, when we speak about decoration of uh, pavilion because uh, it was mainly under control of Zagreb-based painter Tomislav Krizman and after competition of course, other artists from other cities complain heavily about this unproportional representation and actually blaming uh, uh, Krizman and other organizers for creation dominance on this exhibition because, for example, around 70 percentage of all exhibited uh, artworks were created by creation artists and, of course, uh, other artists was disappointed. But here again, we can see that there is actually a question of equal or at least proportional representation. It's not a question to creating a new art together. It just was a conflict otherwise who presented and how. And it's actually, it's manifested in a huge, oh, sorry, a uh, huge uh, scandal which occurred later for the Philadelphia uh, exhibition next year. In this case, the situation starts uh, with learning problems of uh, previous exhibition with organizing an architectural competition. And in this case, uh, the jury uh, was combined like from the one professor from Zagreb, one from Belgrade, some representatives of the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Plechnik was invited to be in jury, but ignored this task again. And so like here again, uh, Slovenian architects were not even involved in the process of choosing or in this conflict. But here in this competition, uh, all awarded project was created by Belgrade uh, architects and even two first projects go to the same architectural team, Christich Brothers. Actually, the explanation which proposed by the Ministry of Trade Industry was that they actually demanded some pavilion in national style, and they insisted that Americans want us to show uh, old style of our sacral architecture. You see our, again, which actually gave some space uh, to presenting different times. And for example, now, when we speak about this like first awarded project, it could be considered from the one hand as a combination, some Byzantine, Romanesque, maybe some Islamic architectural features, but for contemporaries, it was uh, obviously Byzantine and they feel offended that this pavilion will be present uh, some architecture like this. And for example, one of the critics was Tomislav Krizman organizing pre uh, previous exhibition. 
And his involvement actually uh, led to the grandiose uh, scandal letter. Uh, journalists called it Philadelphia War of Our Artists because it was actually very problematic to organizing this exhibition. Because Tomislav Krizman proposed uh, to uh, design interior of this pavilion and using artworks which were already exhibited in the previous uh, exhibition in Paris to save time and money because uh, the kingdom was in quite financial crisis. Uh, but Belgrade artist was strongly against it. On the one hand, they tried to protect the rights of the architects because they claim that like if brother Chris, Christus brother designed pavilion, they have a right to design also interiors. But they also were defending their rights because of course they were afraid that if uh, Griezmann again will uh, create this project, they again will be uh, on the second roles. Ministry of Trade and Industry tried to find some compromise. For example, they proposed an interesting decision that uh, pavilion will be designed by Christich brother, interiors will design with Tomislav Griezmann, but there will be additional pavilion with a movie theater, which will be designed its facade by Belgrade artist and its interior by creation art artists, like to give everybody. But I think here it's actually a big problem, not only because of the different visions of Yugoslav architecture, but it's actually this case show us that official uh, and architects have actually different, very understanding of the essence of architecture because officials constantly propose this idea to separate interior from the exterior. And of course, architects could not be satisfied with this decision. Finally, they came to the, another compromise that uh, Belgrade architects uh, Dragisha Brashevan will design like the central hall and Krizman all other. And there was some division between like what could do Belgrade artists and what could do artists from outside the capital. But finally, this uh, project remained unimplemented due to firstly this administrative reason and also about financial reason. And the next time then the state participate in this uh, international exhibition it was already in the time of the royal dictatorship when uh, King uh, Alexander proclaimed this new ideology of integral Yugoslavism. And in this case, this dictatorship even affected uh, the procedure of selection because in this case, uh, Dragisha Brashevan was appointed without any competition. And he actually tried to follow the requirement of the states, which was in this case, very important one to construct this pavilion from the uh, Yugoslavian wood. So it's Hollywood uh, construction. And they also try to convince him to use some elements of traditional architecture, but in modern way. And here, like we can actually see what the architects follow this requirement on one case, but show kind of specific form. So we can see here his modernist design partly influenced uh, by laws with asymmetrical full shape. And uh, the interesting thing about this pavilion, but it actually was for Brashavan his first attempt to modernize design. He was uh, famous before to his other projects. And for example, I will show you how Brashavan architecture looks before and after uh, this exhibition, because as you can see in the previous period, he have some experiments with uh, romanticism, academism, and even uh, Serbo-Byzantine style. But after this project, he design become extremely uh, modernized and also actually his pavilion to this Barcelona exhibition was a huge success. It's even uh, Vreme uh, newspaper published a huge article about success of our uh, exhibition in uh, Barcelona and you can see in the name of this article what it's a success of our exhibition again and here like uh, they published his portrait and um, give him opportunity to express like himself and uh, his idea about this pavilion. And it was so successful that actually then uh, Yugoslavia construct permanent pavilion to the Milan fair. They again, uh, without competition, appointed Rashavan. And here like we can already see that there is pure modernism without any of this connotation and connections with tradition, which was actually in this way as state in this period during this royal dictatorship try to imagine uh, Yugoslavia as a modernized state. But after this, uh, Yugoslavia for some time didn't participate in this exhibition, maybe due to a uh, financial problem. And next time uh, they participated only in Paris 
1937. Uh, it was already after the King Alexander's death and the change of the regime. And actually in this period, uh, integral Yugoslavia came to the background and now the state official position was to promote in this real Yugoslavism vision. And actually the procedures again were more democratic with organizing an architectural competition. The jury of this competition again was professors from technical faculty from Belgrade, Ljubljana and Zagreb. And in this case, finally, Slovenian architects uh, participate uh, in the choosing of project and uh, one project, the first prize, got to the Belgrade architects, but all other awarded project was creation one. And um, as you can see, Draghi Shabrashevan uh, participated in this competition, but absolutely unsuccessfully. And this project uh, even even wasn't even in the narrow choose of these uh, prizes. But uh, Actually, uh, the jury and the committee was not satisfied with results, and they organized the narrow competition, the Swiss awarded project, directly saying what will, will be more like more monumental facade, like the project themselves, like uh, according to the interior uh, okay with them, but they would like to do it in more monumental way, and actually to use some uh, local materials. And uh, in this second uh, round, uh, of the Josip Seisel won this competition. And before I show you uh, the project which he finally created to this exhibition, I would like to tell you a little bit more about Josip Seisel because he's really a very specific figure for uh, Yugoslav architecture because he started his uh, career as a member of uh, avant-garde uh, Yugoslav uh, uh, magazine Zenit and by creating this uh, graphic design collage and other kinds of constructivist art. Later he got his degree in architecture and participated in some architectural uh, competitions uh, with his friend Josip Pichman and sometimes they even submit design uh, outside of competition in a way protesting uh, of the way in which this architectural competition was organized and it's actually in the late 30s being disillusioned of this architectural life in Yugoslavia, he even turned to only surrealist painting and returned to the architecture, more, mostly to urbanism, only after Second World War. And so now we can see the development of his idea and project. So, for example, you can see initial competition project, project which he submitted to the second round, as doing his project uh, more monumental, and actually the final result. And uh, here you can see that he add this specific kind of columns because they are made from reinforced concrete uh, with uh, and lint on only with marble and they stay outside of the wall actually have no construction function uh, behind it, which actually led to architectural historian to a difficult task to understand what like what's actually happened here with this architecture. Because one way to explain this pavilion design, it's actually uh, something similar with this Barcelona design in uh, 1929, that it's combination of modernism and classical tradition, so depicting Yugoslavia as a new and a modern state, but having these traditions. And for example, one of the organizers of exhibition even published uh, one of official, officials from uh, Ministry of Trade uh, in Industry who organized this exhibition, uh, published an article called One New State with Glorious Tradition. And it's actually, it's a way to understand this familiar like this. But taking into account that uh, Seisel was previously avant-garde artist uh, with a lot of experience, this uh, graphic design, it's actually was very unsuccessful, his own experience participating in competitions during this period. This project could also be understood as a sort of artistic provocation. Because, for example, there were quite typical situation for uh, Yugoslav architectural competition, then modernist design won, but then state or uh, local authorities insisted to monumentalizing. And for example, it's happened also to a project by Seisel friends, Josip uh, Pichman, who created uh, a project to the post office in Belgrade, and then Minister of Construction just add columns to his modernist design. And I think in this case, uh, taking into account that Pichman and Seisel was close friends and worked together, this can be kind of the statement 
about this idea to add in columns to modernist building. And also interesting enough, uh, he published a small text about his pavilion describing like what it actually is. And it's interesting what he used only some artistic poetic metaphors describing his idea as liberating architecture from this uh, utilitarian use. So no mention of any representational or uh, political statement in it. But uh, as we can see, if they compare like his uh, competition projects and uh, final shape, there were some additions because there is also was an attempt to, to unite different arts. So we can see here that there is a, a sculpture, there is a mosaic, but you can see there is more adding but not combining them in one piece of art. It's, it's actually also referring to this idea to national representation here, because under the paradigm of realist Yugoslavia, it was an idea like just to combine different features. For example, you can see that this building have three entrances, like maybe for Serb, Croats and Slovenes. And also uh, this uh, mosaic there, it's a uh, free woman in uh, national uh, uh, dresses, Serbian, Croatian, and Slovene one. So in this case, we can see that they returned this representation just with combination of different features. And for example, we can also see it in the way how it was uh, inside, because this pavilion, it, it has so-called regional uh, court inside, uh, using some architecture of the coastal regions which was very important to this pavilion because the actual exhibition strategy of the state changed. And during this exhibition, Yugoslavia mainly promoted its tourism, but not exports of raw materials, uh, trying to actually to create a feeling with this court, but you're actually already in Yugoslavia, you know, just uh, creating like this space. But the most interesting addition to this pavilion, it's so-called uh, Bosnian house made uh, by wood, of course, which was main expert material. And for example, the designer who created uh, this design is the same who created wooden portal to the Paris exhibition 1925 to the Yugoslav uh, pavilion. And actually here uh, in their interior, wood again become uh, material, which actually even interior was uh, a part of uh, exhibition, but we can see here also this attempt to again return and express Yugoslavian ident identity through vernacular architecture and again through referring to the uh, uh, Bosnian identity. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> we have heard three really rich and interesting papers, so I'm sure there are questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Julia, so you first. Thank you so much for, the, for these three great papers. Um, I, I have a question for Sam. Uh, I wondered what kind of research did uh, Kier Alfi do to create those spectacles? Did he just make it up? Did he do any travels or how, how, how did he come up with those ideas? Um, as far as I know, it is whole cloth out of his imagination. Um, he, he did travel, he was aware of these various places, he went to a variety of fairs, but you can go um, online to the Library of Congress and read the libretto of Columbus, and there seems to be no basis, except Columbus in America, that's the start of the story, and otherwise, because I, again, the, the thing about spectacle is the purpose is the entertainment value, the grandeur. It is possible there was a singing and dancing reception for Columbus in Barcelona when he returned. I've never found any evidence of it. I've got a question for each of you, actually. Um, have I got to move in so I can be seen? Okay. Yeah. I've got a question for each of you, um, or observation. The first, uh, I'm interested... For, I'll start with Sam, actually, since you're there. Um, and um, I was quite struck by the fact that Kir Alfi, you know, he's interested in the whole sort of Indian dimension of British imperialism. It's, that's the impression I got anyway from, from your, your... And I wonder, is that, you know, is that linked to, you know, his Hungarian origins and the way that Hungarians themselves had this kind of around that there was this kind of obviously the whole mythology about 
Oriental origins and, and Hungarians were certainly interested in Sikhs and they saw them as, as, as kind of, uh, you know, fellow, you know, warriors and, and so forth. So I just wonder that, you know, whether that, that's sort of quite striking that he, uh, you've showed a few examples of that, but maybe that's just perhaps not representative. Um, and then for Elvira, that, that what struck me about that final pavilion, to me, it's fascism. It looks, it, it looks just like fascism. And, um, and it's become a kind of much admired, imitated, you know, in countries that weren't necessarily fascist, but nevertheless imitate, you know, the kind of classicism there. It's not just tradition. It's about, you know, that, I suppose some Yugoslav version of Italianita, you know, that, that seems to be what it's about. That just looked like something that could have been built, you know, in the name of, in, in Mussolini, Italy. And then Mira, that I was interested in what happened after 1925, because I can't imagine that an exhibition like that would have been held 10 years later. It seems to me that, that I'd be interested to know, you know, what happened afterwards, because that almost signals a particular moment in you know Soviet cultural policy when things were quite fluid still quite open and before Stalin comes to power and you know he actually starts persecuting these people uh that whose work is being exhibited there I mean is that right I mean I, so it's just an observation but it would be interesting to know what happened afterwards so who would like to start okay um I think that Kiralfi's interest is more a general interest. Um, I would seriously downplay any part of his Hungarianism. Um, by 1901, he was a British citizen. He really wanted to succeed in the United Kingdom. And I think that this interest in India was more a gauge of popular interest and him recognizing that there was a market for this rather than any kind of early resources, and as you saw in, in 1876, the Alhambra, very little American Indian Indian connection going on. It's just the exotic. So maybe Sikhs, but did not saw it, saw it, but did not seek, I, I don't know. Yeah, uh, thank you for a very interesting question. It's actually one part of this discussion about this project would be considered this and this uh, like fascist neoclassical paradigm something else but uh, i think here like we can see there is definitely a lot of this influence in yugoslav architecture at the time so if they put some other projects which was actually constructed there is definitely is and i think in this case uh, then you see this brush oven project is like very similar to this, some uh, Italian design. Uh, but I think like in case of the Sisal Pavilion, it's very obvious this this columns not putting like in the wall, but near it. And unfortunately we don't have enough source, even if Sisal wrote about his pav pavilion, it's quite, uh, it's a sepatic text. But I think here it can be more considered as a deconstruction of this uh, uh, fascist, uh, architecture and influences but again i think it's very good question because now we can see what like this building could be interpreted in different ways uh yes thank, thank you for the question it's um uh, it's true that it's a very special contribution uh, that was made in 1925 which was uh, a contribution of a very early soviet uh, ideologist as well uh, um and um, it's called also as the golden 20s in this national politic in, uh, in Soviet Russia, which of course then changed in the 30s, which we will probably also um, hear about uh, later with uh, Elisaveta. Um, but um, um, I would say that it's, uh, um, it's, the purpose was to show the tendencies where it's supposed to go. And it's also made obvious the problems that they had to, uh, to impact, but I think the, um, uh, the belief was there that uh, it can be changed at this point, or it should be changed, and how it is uh, going to be changed. And then, um, ten uh, uh, years later, at the latest, it became clear that uh, the uh, direction changed, and so it uh, became a whole other thing. Thank you. And Vladislav, what's next? Thank you. Sorry, I have a, an, another that uh, that Julia and Matthew asked before uh, for Samuel. Um, so thank you for showing us yet again that uh, these uh, 
uh, world fairs were sort of uh, markets of very bizarre uh, experiences, market of symbolisms uh, and experiences. But I think that it's not really, we can't really suffice with the, um, with the fact that this colonization and this exotization of uh, non-American or non-European uh, cultures were just a zeitgeist, were just uh, something that they came across and uh, sort of need to uh, study the, what was behind it and what politics and policies were behind it. For example, like at the Louisiana Purchase exhibition, the exhibition of the Filipino village was, uh, was actually tied very closely to actual contemporary politics towards the govern governing, governing of uh, Filipino islands uh, by the American government. So I'm interested, I'm asking if um, Kuralfi was somehow um, part of the political structures or political debates or discussions towards the non-American or non-European cultures and countries. I, I want to be clear, I'm not saying that colonialism was not a topic of interest or discussion at that time, but I think it's important to keep in mind that there are, in Kiralfi's work, or for instance, even at the 1904 St. Louis exhibition, yes, there is the, the Igorot Village, this fantastically large exhibition of Filipino culture, which celebrates the rise of the new American empire that we you know, we're now a world empire. Roosevelt had sent the white fleet around the world and, and began a, a, a century of American power. But I would also point out there was a five acre recreation of Jerusalem. We were not a colonial power in Jerusalem. There is this trade off of the interest and the zeitgeist. And I think in the case of Kiralfi, he has a very good eye for what will sell. I think, I, I don't know what, I've not found anything about his opinions of the British Empire, of the Indian presence, except for the fact that I made this exhibition and I made a lot of money doing it. So it's, these things do exist in parallel. There is that type of, and there certainly is, and I'm, I'm sure Harry would say, there were people who objected to this colonialist idea. There were people who were very, very aware of the downfall, but, but that doesn't mean that Kiralfi was one of them, that he could profit from that interest without being involved in that interest. Um, so um, Imre Kiralfi is the man of the hour, it seems. Uh, there's two more questions for, for Sam. Um, the first one from Tom Spaulding is, um, did Kiralfi have any personal role in the choice of selecting an Irish exhibit in 1908, or was he working at a higher level in the organization of Shepherd's Bush site? Um, and I'll just read out the second one as well. Maybe you can take them together. And um, the second one is from Elisa Chassal. Um, and it goes, uh, do you know more about the impact of Imre Kiralfi on the other entertainment entrepreneurs at the turn of the century? Did architects, exhibition organizers, or entrepreneurs um, study his spectacles and exhibition grounds or travel to appropriate his work? Okay, um, two very good questions. As far as the Irish village is concerned, I don't know what the decision-making process was. I know that um, with McClintock Soap was one of the sponsors of this and I, I can't imagine that there was a deliberate action because one of the things that it recreated was the ancestral home of the great grandfather of William McKinley, which doesn't really seem to be a celebration of Irish heritage in any way. Um, I think again, that, that part of the idea was to recreate something that would draw people. As far as the second question, um, Again, I assume that people saw that success succeeded and that there are numerous copies of Kiralfi's type of exhibitions throughout the world because he sort of brought all these elements together and showed what the finished product looks like. Um, I don't know that he worked with anyone in particular anywhere else. Um, I don't imagine it because I, I'm sure he's a very pleasant person in her life, but um, he seems to be extremely mercenary. Um, if he can make money doing it, he will do it. 
And if you make money following his idea, he will sue you because you're making money following his idea. He's very protective of his success. So I hope that that answers both questions. There is another one for you <laughs> um, from Karen, um, which is a follow-up to the, the ones that you answered just before. So to what degree did Kiralfi employ or display Asian African migrant performers or other diasporic minorities in his various spectacles? Certainly his collaborator P.T. Barnum did. I am wondering about the sorts of invisible labor that Marta raised yesterday in her opening remarks. Again, I, my sense is that Kiralfi was much more interested in the theatrical. I know for Nero, for instance, he recruited solely from the New York population. Um, his goal was kind of a fake exoticism. Um, I know that, <clears throat> for instance, uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, what, while there is a certain amount of exploitation of, of Native Americans, there is also an extremely interesting aspect that it was employing Native Americans and promoting them and bringing them to light and, and actually not having people play the role of Native Americans. I mean, if, if one thinks of, say, Germany and, and Karl May, where, you know, if you say old Shatahan, Christian's going to start crying when Vinatou dies. Um, he actually had Native Americans and he treated them well. So the other thing to keep in mind, part of his success, particularly with Shepherd's Bush, was he owned the grounds. It was other people who were responsible for organizing the exhibitions within. Um, as I said, he, the, the key thing is he retained the right to the concessions because that's where the money is. Um, what he did for the Franco-British exhibition, he was not, he was nominally one of the organizers, but he was not the person actually organizing it. For those exhibitions that follow, his name is on it, it gives it the imprimatur of a Kiralfi production, but his role is to count the money. Um, there's one question from Mira. Um, from Elisa again. Um, so um, did the Kustari art artifacts um, that were displayed or sold in Paris after the 1925 Expo? Um, it's very missing, I think. But did they exist in other structures such as museums and department stores? In France, or in general. That is not, um, Elisa, would you maybe like to clarify? Um, well, they existed in uh, France in stores, uh, for sure. I can answer maybe in both uh, regards. Um, they, uh, since the 1900s uh, uh, World Fair, it's, um, uh, th there were stores in uh, Paris, actually, and it, um, and it opened uh, um, by uh, the Moscow Costal Museum, uh, um, uh, uh, one of the uh, um, uh, Messinas, uh, Sergei uh, Morozov, one of the of, from the uh, big Morozov family, um, and uh, they actually uh, sold uh, um, individual items. And there was another uh, in, um, another store also in Paris uh, that then took uh, big um, 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 sales, um, um, like from other de department stores. Uh, um, so it, was not, it wasn't individual sales, but they sold to, to the department stores. But when, where exactly they went and in which amount, I cannot answer that. Um, and in Russia, of course, there were museums and also um, big uh, national exhibitions, but it was um, rather in the Western uh, Europe uh, concentrated. Thank you very much. And uh, a question for Ebra. Um, my question would be, um, can you elaborate a little bit on this uh, Plechnik connection? Because mm -hmm. he could have been somebody, um, you know, to, to create a Yugoslavian style, which yeah, would have been univer um, universal, but on the other hand, not uh, based on this historicism or this classical uh, language of form. Uh, was this kind of um, 
Yeah, beef with the Bergratz uh, central <laughs> um, national motivated or national politics motivated or more like, I don't know, some inter internal conflict uh, between, I don't know, Yugoslavian uh, architectural crisis. I don't know what was the, the, yeah. the basic situation. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you for the very good question, because I think this could be a topic for some specific officials, but not only officials, but also some art critics, for example, Nakosta Strainic was like, um, during this period, uh, always try to claim that like Plechnik is a perfect person for creating this style. They actually want him to create this style. And for example, also propose that like Ljubljana could be in his school, maybe not Plechnik himself, but at least like uh, his students could contribute to these uh, connections. But uh, it's actually very specific kind of situation what Plechnik himself um, kind of ignoring this participation as, for example, not only to these uh, uh, national pavilions where he just to accept first this invitation and then refuse, but for example, in some other cases when he was invited to be in jury member to selection of the projects, he sent his deputies instead of him and try not to deal this, uh, this kind of project, but actually I think uh, a lot of people there like actually imagine this way for uh, Yugoslav architecture through his architecture, not only I think because of uh, the architectural merits of his work, but also as a uh, way to avoid this constant conflicts between Belgrade and Zagreb based architects. But I think it's also a case with actually Slovene position in the state. So for example, if they try not to see only an architecture, but wider that uh, Slovenes, uh, they not participate in some of these uh, conflicts and um, not so active politically, but also Slovene architects uh, didn't participate that much uh, as you and Yugoslav uh, uh, competitions like in other cities. So it was quite a close community which created this kind of specific style and architecture for Ljubljana. Again, in the articles uh, writing about our architecture, but kind of ignoring and escaping this involvement uh, in Yugoslav architecture, which actually officials and art critics uh, expected from them. <laughs> yeah, because it, uh, and as they explain it, it's like our architecture, like it's the way how they construct and imagine this Ljubljana. Again, you see like uh, they have this very specific kind of architecture and specific kind of understanding in it, like without any connection with this uh, Yugoslav topics and actually if we compare buildings constructed in Ljubljana with constructed in Zagreb and Belgrade, the dynamics of stylistic change will be totally different. So they didn't even follow like this, like let's say stream of Yugoslav architecture. Yeah. <laughs> Does it mean that uh, the Serbian authorities or the Serbian government was, uh, was ready to give up this kind of um, Serbian hegemony um, in this context. If if um, Plechnik would have been ready to to, yeah. to take over the very good point. Thank you for that. Yes, actually, it appeared which what I show like this uh, Philadelphia war and other kinds of things. It's actually from fact that uh, Belgrade artist was dissatisfying from the fact they were not favorized, because especially in the beginning of twenties, uh, Yugoslav authorities put a lot of expectation uh, both on Plechnik and Meštrović. So one Swamin and one Krod, uh, because they were already famous and especially the needs of the international representation. They actually, I think in some case, like they need uh, their international reputation in order to create the vision of the state. And that's why they actually favorized them uh, against like this Serbian architects and then Serbian architects was like very disappointed and start to uh, like maybe not like fight but like at least to protect their rights and they also for example in this Philadelphia case they even um, uh, put uh, some uh, uh, letters to the leading Serbian politician Nikola Pasic and a uh, ministerial council like actually trying to understand like how it's happened that uh, Serbia dominated like in other fields, but not the fields of arts. <laughs> Thank you. And sorry, we last question. And 
Sorry, it's not really, uh, it's just a short comment to all to, to this discussion. Um, so from what I know from my research on Kotyara while Plechnik was in Prague, he actually kind of hated uh, being uh, in uh, attending competitions as, as submitting his projects, but even more, he hated to be on committees. So <laughs> that might be also part of the, 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 the thing. Also becoming religious at this time, there's that weird sort of withdrawal from the world and, and very much that focus on reusing smaller materials and becoming yeah. the priest that his brother had. <laughs> yeah, and actually only one building which is finally constructed for Belgrade is a Franciscan church. Okay, well, thank you for this really interesting discussion and especially thank you for the free papers. It was, I think, a really interesting session and I really enjoyed it and I hope you did too.